out of Brian. Um, I'm going to talk to you mainly about players, how we can support the psychological development and the personal development of players across time, but also across age groups. I'm very aware this is based on simply my experiences, and different individuals with different backgrounds and different characteristics might have a different experience. So first of all, what are we actually dealing with? I think Martin touched upon it a little bit when he spoke, that we're always looking for the needle in the haystack, but actually what's the bigger picture? So we've got 1.5 million lads that play structured football every single week in England. Of that, 10,000 Martin's up to 12,000, so there's 12,000 boys contracted to Academy Football Club. Of those 12,000, less than 10% are going to obtain a scholarship. Less than 10% of those will obtain a professional contract. And ultimately, which I think is really interesting, 0.5% will actually make a living from the game. And we're looking at that from Premier League right through the different rungs of professional football. But then if we look in the lower leagues, this exaggerates some of the psychological challenges that they might face. Often club motivation differs in lower leagues in comparison to the championship or premiership. And we've seen that recently with what's gone on with Bolton and Berry. So at a lower level, what we might try and do is develop youth talent. Once we've developed that talent, we throw them into a first team environment so they transition from youth to senior age group, maybe the age of 17 or 18, rather than the age of 22, 23, and 24. And then we hope that they can prove themselves. We hope they've got the skills to be successful, and if they have, can we sell them on? Once we sell them on, we make the money and we invest that back into the club to try and attain some financial stability. But what's the impact of that on the player from a psychological perspective, but also from a personal development view? What's life like in the lower leagues? We all know and we all talk about the lucrative contracts that professional footballers receive. But they're all short term, and at a lower level, those contracts might not be so lucrative. So if you've got somebody in League 1 or League 2, just sign their first professional contract, the two-year contract. That's not enough to sustain their life post-retirement, which increases the importance of us developing their psychosocial skill set. But actually, at the moment, there's a limited focus on that, and the ECCC is starting to introduce more guidelines that facilitate a more holistic approach to development that should look at how we develop players at the different levels because there's really unique challenges based on which environment or which context they're actually in. Again, we all know about the footballers' lifestyle. We know a little bit about culture. It's ruthless, it's harsh, it's volatile, it's masculine. And players are really socialised or they're encouraged to formulate their identity within that particular setting. So they're under a cultural pr pressure from teammates, but also from key stakeholders. And what do they want to do? They want to do what we all do, fit in. So in order to fit in, they try and live a particular lifestyle. And that lifestyle is exaggerated at a lower level because they're always trying to adhere to the tag of I'm a professional footballer. And yes, you may be, but you're on a two year contract playing in League Two. And what can that do? That might lead to unhealthy addictions. So they turn to gambling behaviors. Then they get themselves into more financial difficulty. And then the behavior intensifies because they're trying to find a solution to this negative balance that's going on in their life. And the impact of that is really poor mental health. And that's poor mental health at youth level, but also poor mental health at senior level. So as sport and exercise psychologists, or sports psychology practitioners, how might we support that and where do we intervene? I think one more point I want to add just specifically about the leagues is that professional football and professional sport, we talk about it's all or nothing. We win and there's no second, there's no third. We're a loser otherwise. You think about that in the lower leagues. If you don't get a professional contract and you're a, a League One or League Two academy, you've got nowhere to go. If you don't get a professional contract and you're a premiership club, you've got the opportunity to drop down a level. If you're unsuccessful at the age of 16 or at the age of 18 and you're in League One or League Two, that's you done. You drop to semi-professional football or you exit the game. So how actually can we psychologically prepare them for the transition? E triple B, it's really nice to see that they've put in some more guidelines which facilitate a diversity of practice. It's now accounting for a range of different sports psychology delivery methods to facilitate a holistic approach.
approach, inclusive of key stakeholders towards psychological development and well-being, and the term player care is being used more and more within professional football. So what did I do or what might I recommend when actually delivering sports psychology in this context? The first step is to observe. Observe interactions, observe behaviours, observe a range of different settings. It's not simply about observing training and observing matches. If you're sat on the bus on the way to training, where do different individuals sit? Who do the different individuals speak to? What's life like in the canteen? Who's late? Who's early? Who wears particular type of boots? It's all silly questions, but it gives you a more holistic understanding of who the individual is. Have conversations, meaningful conversations, and not so meaningful conversations. Speak to different individuals. Speak to the coaches, speak to the parents, speak to the players. What about the kit man? He might know the players or the individuals to a much greater level than other key stakeholders do. If you've got a coach, a player might be reluctant to speak to the coach. They might sit for 20, 25 minutes with the kit man whilst he's doing the laundry and just open up about their life because they don't feel he's going to be judged. So who might you seek meaningful conversations with to start to develop a practice and an understanding of the setting and relationships. Relationships with a range of stakeholders within the organisation that do and don't have an impact directly on players, again, with all the purpose of understanding, a deeper understanding of the culture. So I've tended to work with players across three different support methods, individual support, group workshops and pitch-based sessions. And these were kind of designed with the EPPP in mind. Um, individual support sessions are definitely my preferred method, and it's probably where I had most scope to work, because I was working in an environment that was unaware of sports psychology previously. I was the only female working in that environment, and actually, I was allocated to work with the academy, um, but the first team captain, it probably within the first couple of weeks of me being there, he was sat injured, and he wasn't joking, he said, can you read my poem and tell me if I'll be back on the weekend? And that was, like, that was quite funny, yeah, okay. But the reality is that demonstrated his understanding of sports psychology or his lack of understanding. So how was I gonna make a difference to these lads? How was I gonna educate them? Group workshops I'll talk a little bit more about and pitch-based sessions were really interesting. And I guess that kind of aligns to a little bit about what Christine said. So what's the primary purpose of working with the players? Our primary purpose was to take a look at these lads, age 15, 16, 17, and in a maximum of three years, how many of, we, of them can we have in the starting line or on a consistent basis? And if we can transition those lads so that at the age of 15 they're surviving in an under 18 age group, and at the age of 17 or 18 they're starting week in, week out at first team level, then have we done our job in securing the financial stability of the club? But then we've got to think about the individuals. Those individuals within that circle all have different characteristics. They have different strengths. They have different weaknesses. They have different backgrounds. They're different people. They're unique. And we all want the same end goal. But actually, a sports psychologist needs to feed to or tailor their work towards the individual needs of each of those individual of each of those stakeholders, and how might we do that? So individual support sessions is one approach. Certain characteristics. So what I've done is I've researched quite a lot about what managers in the game are saying players need. What are the characteristics they they desire? What do we want a player to look like? And actually, if we've got the characteristics that we think players need in order to be successful, how can we start to develop them? And what we find a lot of people talk about is dedication. Are they committed? Are they passionate? Do they have the desire? Have they got the love for the game? Most, the answer for most is probably yes. Are they resilient? How can we develop resilience over time? Leadership and communication skills, emotional intelligence, and have they got the self-belief? And I think by starting to think about certain characteristics, you can start to fit a program together that helps you to develop an end player. But from the individual support sessions, what became really apparent was I'd sit down with a player, 
It, I might expect it to be, he's having a bit of a dip in his performance. How white might we deal with his confidence level? What could I do to support him in the next game? Well, in the reality, there is much more than performance-based stresses. This is what's going on in their lad's life. They do not have the opportunity to speak up about things previously. So how over time could I support them to develop, ultimately as an individual? But by developing them as an individual, it will inevitably impact their performance. So what I'm going to do is just give two case studies that are non-performance based. However, they show the importance of sports psychology and the importance of a multidisciplinary approach when working with those that are and those that aren't successful. First case scenario, um, this lad, at this period in time, he was an under-16 player. He'd signed for us four weeks ago. Um, he came from a premiership club after being released as a scholar. We just signed him on for a two-year scholarship, and he did his ACL in a training day. So this lad did his ACL at a point where he was trying to fit in to a new organisation. So he was isolated. Not only was he trying to fit in, he was trying to cope psychologically with being deselected from another organisation. He didn't turn up for his GCSEs, so we sat no exams. So he's got absolutely no alternative. So over time, from a psychological perspective, I worked with physiotherapists, with different stakeholders, with coaches, with the education officer, to try and support this individual to, through his isolation, to develop a stronger and a broader identity to have honest and open questions with himself as to where am I at right now and what does this mean? And let's face the reality that six months ago, I was flying at a top premiership club. Now I've got nine months of rehab ahead of me, no qualifications, and I'm a little bit isolated. And he bounced to and fro between what I like to call black goldfish, so total isolation, to being a part of the team. And how would you feel if you're in the gym every single day in a new environment where you don't know anybody and you see the people that you want to be involved with, that you want to fit in, out there on the training pitch? You've got your coach, your coach is interested in your players because your players can get in the results. This lad can't get any result at the moment. All he can do is rehab. So he went through a period of rehab. Nine months later, he went back to training and not long after he'd returned to training, he did his ACL he did his MCL, and he had to have a percentage of cartilage removed from his knee. It was at that point that they said to him, you're never going to play properly again. So now in a space of two years, this lad's done his A. He's gone from top premiership club, released, done his ACL, redone his ACL, still no qualifications, psychologically struggling with isolation. He's lost his identity. That footballer's lifestyle, that culture that he fitted in with before, he's got, he's got no future in the game. So as a psychologist, how can I support him or even be there for him and just listen to him start to develop a new avenue? And then over time, it took a considerable amount of time. It was probably three to four years later and not long ago, I got a text saying, Fran, I think you'd like to hear I've got a job at City in the community coaching. I think it's under sixes or under sevens and just a smiley face. And that's simply all that you need to know that that lad that's a professional football environment, and when we say we're looking for the needle in the haystack, we also need to care for those that aren't that needle in the haystack, that don't make that journey. And as a sports psychologist, it's our responsibility to work as part of a multidisciplinary team in order to do so. Next case study, so I think this highlights where's our accountability, where's players' accountability, the ability to make decisions the ability to take ownership of situations and the ability to communicate. So again, under 18 lads, gets the bus into training. He was having a difficult time. He's three months till his contract runs out. At that point, I know his contract isn't getting renewed. I think he probably had half an idea. He'd often get bought off after, say, 60 minutes in a game. And they got the bus into training on a Monday morning. And he came in, he said, can I see you for 10 minutes? My response was, yeah, okay, give me 10 or 15 minutes. I was talking to a physio at the time. He went into the office and he shut the door. And I was fully expecting that conversation to be, I got bought off again at the weekend. What can I do? Because I consider going out alone. I've not got long left to prove myself. Time is ticking away. No, it was my dad's had a heart attack. He's in a critical condition in hospital. I daren't tell the coaches because I don't want them to think I'm weak. 
So then at that point in time, as a sports psychologist again, now that we have a more open and understanding environment within professional football, how can I work with those coaches to say, let's look at the bigger picture? Look at where this lad is in his life. What's the most important thing for him right now? The most important thing for him right now is what's going on with his family. So how can we make him feel comfortable in coming and speaking to us, maybe removing himself from that environment to go and clear his head, to go and do what he needs to do with the understanding that we all know he's not going to make it anyway? And have we developed or do we have the responsibility to develop prior to this the psychological or the psychosocial skill set so that he is able to make a better decision in the future? What I would hope to see is that lad at 17, 18 years of age has the confidence to walk in and tell a coach. He has the communication skills to walk in and tell a coach, and he has the resilience to know, yeah, I might not have experienced something like this before, but they will support me. Whether I'm going to be successful in the game or not successful in the game, ultimately this is about me as an individual and me as a person. So what lessons do I think we can learn from simple case studies like that that happen on a daily basis? What we might see in the media is things that are performance focused, it's all about results. But there's individual case studies going on all of the time that we might not be so aware of. The importance of a multidisciplinary approach, whether that's working with the player welfare officer, the education officers, the physiotherapists, the sports science team, most importantly the coaches, to have a clear view and to understand that the most important person is our client and at that time our client is the player. Identity and isolation. Every single footballer, whether they make it or not, will face threats or challenges to their identity. How can we support them to develop a broad identity, to be able to deal with isolation, to be able to cope with the professional football culture, and either transition into a successful life out of sport, or to be that needle in the haystack and make the jump from youth to senior <coughs> football at the age of 17 or 18. And ultimately, transferable skill development. I think we have to take some accountability for that, knowing that not everybody will be successful. So what can we do to prepare them for life afterwards? Group workshops. So this was something that I was really apprehensive about because I didn't want it to feel like a classroom. If I'm delivering a workshop and I've got a group of lads, and it shows on the picture, sat in front of me, is that going to feel a little bit like I'm the teacher and they're the students? Because that's not really what I want to achieve. They need to be and engage, they need to be interacting, they need to be involved, they almost need to lead the session. So we tried to develop some core topics that related to the ECCP, but also to educate them on core psychological skills and the process to becoming a professional footballer. What are the critical moments that they might face? So that looks a little bit like this. You see some core mental skills in there, like your goal setting, your imagery, <coughs> But also, what does it mean to become a professional? What are the challenges that they'll face becoming a professional? And what does a professional look like? Because if you've been within football from the age of six or seven, jump into the under 18s as a professional, the under 23s as a professional, might not seem any different to what you've faced every day so far, but the environment does differ. Mental health awareness, which is something that's becoming really important. And what about loans? How many players do we currently have on loan? How many players have we sent out on loan? And where do they come from? They come from all over Europe, maybe even all over the world. And you see normal training session there. How many players are your own? And how many players are from other institutions? And who have you sent out? And I think it's about relationships within a club, but also relationships between clubs to get some form of consistency in how we can support these individuals by considering their biological state, their psychological state, and their social state. If you think of a player that's come on loan, socially they're going to be challenged because they're in an uncomfortable environment. They've got to very quickly adapt to being okay with being uncomfortable because they've got a small amount of time to prove themselves. Psychologically, it's a challenge. Am I good enough? Why am I here? Why have I been isolated? I've got to prove myself. I wonder what the coach is feeling back. The coach is interested in his own players, not me on loan, I'm here to pick up the numbers. And then biologically, have they been sent out on loan as a younger player in order to see if they can cope with the men's game? Because if they have, we know they're going to struggle from a biological perspective as well. Have they physically matured? 
For a sport and exercise psychologist, are we aware of what was delivered previously, what's delivered in that home club? And then how does that impact what we deliver to or how we work with them when they come to us? And if we're sending a player out on loan, what kind of measures do we have in place to support that player? Are we going to send them on a three-month loan and have no communication with them? Leave the other club to communicate and just let the coaches? Or as a sports psychologist, are we going to stay in touch? Are we still going to be able to meet them if they're five hours away? All of these questions I think we need to start to think about and maybe put structures or different things in place so that we can have a more coherent plan. Coach education, so Christy has talked loads about how he's worked with coaches. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about it in the form of, we delivered formal workshops, education workshops. Again, um, coaches were not really familiar with sports psychology. It's starting to become a lot more accepted. Coaches getting much more on board with it now. And so what we did was we delivered a range of different topics to try and help them to understand what a high performance culture looks like and how we can develop a high performance culture. And that's by them having difficult questions with themselves, questioning their own practices. Pitch-based sessions. How can we incorporate sports psychology into traditional training sessions? And how might a coach do that? So for example, introduction of state white noise to develop resilience, to challenge their attention control, their attention focus, moving players up and down age groups based again on biopsychosocial factors helping them to better deal with pressure. But then, again, what was really interesting was that coaches tended to seek support informally about their own challenges and their own life, and that's something that's not really been researched yet. So we have the coaches that deliver something to players. Coaches are responsible for player development, as we are. But then a coach would often come and sit with me and say, oh, I'm struggling with this, or this particular player I'm finding really challenging and I don't know how to deal with them, and perhaps it's because I'm not spending much time because I've got a lot going on at home. And all of a sudden you start to see that there's a parallel. Players face challenges, we face challenges, and coaches face challenges. And if we start to address the development of all three, it might create a culture that's more inclusive and that's more supportive. Parent education programs. So there's been loads of research on the importance of parents and including parents within sports psychology support. And I think what I tried to do was get the parents to accept that you, you're not aware when you have a child that you're going to be the parent of an elite sports child. That brings challenges and stresses in itself. If you've got three lads and say a sister as well, and the sister plays netball, and two lads play for an academy, and one lad does nothing. What's the impact on the family dynamics? So if you've got the two boys going to training, and you've got the mum goes with the two boys, and the dad goes with the daughter to netball, the other lad flicks in between, how do you manage that as a family? How do you deal with the parental stresses? How might you support your child to develop the identity? How might you act as a parent? What questions might you ask them? The five C's, which has become really important within the FA. Um, lifestyle management. We know realistically that the chances of them making it are very slim. So as a parent, how can we help them to manage their lifestyle, broaden their identity, and keep it enjoyable? So that ultimately when they do transition out of the sport, which is highly likely, they've had a positive experience. Okay, just future directions. Really important, I think, is aligning with player care, the introduction of mental health. Firstly, what is mental health? What does the term mean? So how can everybody become more aware of it? And if we're more aware, how might we then start to educate key stakeholders to pick up on certain signals? And once we've got that, do we signpost or do we support? And in line with that, it's shifting the culture to focus on the skill development of individuals in preparing them for both success and non-sport and success. Thank you.